You know, I remember being in the first grade. I didn't get to go to preschool or kindergarten or all the things that they have nowadays. So the first grade was it. And it just seemed like first grade took forever. And then, you know, I'm back in, in I'm back taking courses in college and there's 16 weeks and at the beginning of the the semester you look and wow that's 16 weeks and then you have the paradox of going to school because you want to be done with it but you want as much time as possible to get that same stuff done but you know um, it's just kind of one of those things that uh, uh, but anyway it, it, you know and the older you get the faster time goes by. Um, I'm amazed um, at how quickly. I remember uh, almost, well, two and a half years ago when I started going back to school at CWI, that first semester seemed to go. And now it's like I just finished my last semester and it went by like that. Um, but anyway, it's just one of those things I wanted to take note and take stock. You know, next time... Uh, we meet together here like this, it will be 2020. And I remember all the dire predictions when Y2K was coming and the world was going to come to an end and, and Armageddon was going to happen and all these things. And, and, and you know, um, we don't know. We just don't know. That's in the Lord's hands. And uh, can I let you in on a little secret? I'm really glad it's in his hands. I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's way too much responsibility for me. Um, if you'll bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you this, this morning. And Lord, we are so grateful to be here today. I'm grateful for all those that you have brought here. To come and to worship you. To fellowship with one another, Lord. And to uh, deepen our relationship with you through the uh, hearing of your word and Lord also as we strengthen those bonds of friendship that we have with those around us Lord I pray that you add your blessing to the message this morning that it would be your words that are spoken it's your message I pray that you would open the hearts and minds of those who are listening to receive the message Lord, that there is um, application for everybody here today. That we would take it into our world and be the gospel light that you've called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to Jesus. That is the title of my sermon. And we will be in the text of Mark 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. I toyed with going all the way to um, 29, but that was rather long, and I can be long enough the way it is. So I figured if we keep the, keep the number of verses down, maybe uh, we'll get out of here at a decent hour. How about that? Be my parting gift for you for this year. How about that? And maybe uh, when the pews get redone, I may, you know, uh, no, I won't do that to you. So last week, we looked at the fact that the people around Jesus at the time did not fully understand who he was. We've seen that up to this point in Mark. They just didn't quite understand who Jesus was. And this included the disciples. They were expecting Messiah to come and restore the kingdom of Israel by removing Roman rule and placing an heir on of David on the throne of Israel to be their ruler. We found that even Peter, who correctly identified Jesus as Messiah, was one of those who was focusing on the wrong aspect of Jesus as the Messiah. So this week, as we continue, we're going to discover that, as we continue to discover who Jesus is, we are going to be looking at what took place on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
what took place and why it was so important, why it still is so important to this day. Today we find, and in, in the text that we're looking at today, we're going to find that Jesus is going up on the mountain. He's taking only three of his disciples with him. And this is not uncommon for Jesus to do. And generally it was Matt, excuse me, generally it was Peter, James, and John. Those were the three. And it's not that Jesus was necessarily playing favorites, but we know in any group, in any organization, you, um, no matter how many, you always have one or two people or maybe a half dozen, depending on how big your organization is, of those who tend to stand out, of those who are natural leaders. And for any number of reasons, <clears throat> they tend to be kind of the inner circle. You go back and you look at David's mighty men. They were a group unto themselves, and yet in that group there were, there were those who were put above they were called out uh, for specific things. They were the mighty men of the mighty men, if you will. So this is nothing new. Um, and the only main significance probably is that uh, Jesus probably had a, a closer relationship with these three. Perhaps they were more engaged than the rest of them. I don't know. But Jesus took only three people with him up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. Why is this? Well, it wasn't a come. I believe that Jesus took these three up there to be witnesses to the account that we're going to read about today. Old Testament says that if you're going to convict somebody, you need at least two witnesses, and Jesus took one extra. He took these three to be witnesses to what took place, what he knew was going to take place in a little while. Here we find that even with all that had transpired at that time and all that the disciples had witnessed, they still did not get it. They still did not understand Jesus' ministry. They did not believe that the Christ was to suffer. Today there are those who do not fully understand who Jesus is. They call him a good teacher, a moral man, someone we should emulate. But they do not recognize Jesus as the one who had to suffer on our account in order to take away our sins and reconcile us back to the Father. Today, as Christians, there are times when we sometimes forget or don't really understand who Jesus is. Why does he allow bad things to happen if he is so good? Is one of those things we don't always understand. The point of the story, the point of what is recorded here is to remind us that no matter what we think about Jesus, we need to listen to him. And if you haven't turned to the text, if you would at this time, I'm going to read it for you. And Jesus was saying to them, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no wanderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a crowd formed over, excuse me, then a cloud formed overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. I need a reverb button right now, but I don't have one. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. All at once, they looked around and saw no one except with them ex anymore except Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another, 
what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things, and yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. There's a lot going on there in these, thir in these 13 verses. There's a lot of meat in here, and unfortunately I don't have time to get into all of it. But the focus of my sermon is on verse 7, where it said, Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. I believe this is the point of this story, of this episode that is recorded here. This is the main point. This is the main focus. So keep that in mind as we go through this, this morning or now this afternoon. Going back to verse 1, Jesus makes a, what would be to the disciples and to those around him, what I would consider a stunning prediction. He says that there are those with him at that time who would not die until they had saw or had seen the coming of the kingdom of God. Think about that. Because what that meant was that there were going to be those who were going to die before that took place. That probably made a whole bunch of them excited, thinking, I could be one of these who are going to see the kingdom come. Now, we understand if you've been reading, if you've read Mark up to this point, you understand that the disciples and those around them were thinking of, oh great, we're going to be here to watch Jesus kick some butt, and he's going to kick the Romans out, and we're going to establish the new kingdom, and we're going to go back to the way it was. That's not what Jesus had in mind. Not at this time. They still hadn't gotten it yet. So six days later, and if you read another passage, it says eight days later. So it depends on who was telling the story and, 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 and what, after what particular, um, when these things were, were said and how late they heard him. It has nothing to do, the discrepancy here does not change any theolo theology, it doesn't change any um, outcome of any promises that were made, it doesn't change anything of what took place. Just maybe somebody who is recording, maybe somebody uh, didn't, Maybe somebody heard it later than the others. Anyway, I just want to point that out because this episode is recorded in three places, Matthew, Mar here in Mark, and in Luke. And we are going to be visiting each one of those a little bit because each one, each story, each telling gives us a little more detail. It helps bring the whole story together to give us a better understanding so six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. And he brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. What was another episode where somebody was brought high up on a mountain, and they were, their, their appearance was changed? Go back to Mount Sinai and Moses. 
And when he came down, he was because he had spent so much time in the presence of God, he was glowing, shall we say, since he was radiant. And it was so much that he, he was so self-conscious about it that he placed a veil over his face. Jesus here was transfigured. But there was a little more that took place. If we go to Luke chapter 9... Verses 28 and 29. It gives us a little more. And here is it says, Some eight days after these sayings, so give or take, He took along Peter and John and James, and He went up on the mountain to pray. Jesus, Luke tells us, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. And we know that this was Jesus' habit, to go to a, a secluded place to pray. It was his custom. This is nothing new. But Jesus didn't always take his disciples with him. This time he took Peter, James, and John with him. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. Why Mark doesn't put this in I don't know but if we believe that Mark got wrote his story based on what Peter told him um, one of the one of, one of the uh, one of the uh, and we'll get to it in a little bit one of the stories mentions that they had fallen asleep. Perhaps, I don't know, I, I, I don't know why Peter doesn't mention this to Mark as he's writing this down, that they went up to pray, but he doesn't. But they went up to pray. Jesus went up to pray. He brought his disciples with him to pray. And he was transfigured. And while we might not be transfigured in the same sense and the same way that Jesus was, you know we can be transfigured? Our lives can be changed by spending time in the presence of the Father. Moses' appearance was changed. Isaiah in his vision, a vision that he saw. God sitting on his throne in the holy, and his holiness and Isaiah was changed. And if you go to Revelation and you look and you, and you, you see John's record, what he recorded about the worship of the Father as he was sitting on his throne, John's life was changed. Our lives can be changed in the presence of the Father, in the presence of the Holy God. Jesus was transfigured. This is something that took place from the inside out. I don't know what all that meant, but something happened, and Jesus' appearance was different. His clothes became whiter. Could you imagine a laundry detergent commercial? You know, Purcell, Purcell or whatever it is now, they are the ones that really are, are harping on the whiteness and brightness of their clothes and stuff. I don't know how you do that, but it says that no launderer could, could get Jesus' clothes as white as they became. That was a God thing. That was a God thing. And Jesus stood out. And I believe that You know, when, after Jesus was baptized and he came out of the waters, recorded that the light shone down on him and the, the Holy Spirit descended as a dove and God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. 
something happened there. But here, God, I believe, somehow imparted, not that Jesus wasn't holy before, but God somehow physically manifested the, a holiness on Jesus. Something that was now visible to those around him. I don't know how long this lasted, if it faded like that of Moses. But it happened. And if that wasn't enough for the disciples to take in, next thing they know, behold, Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Reinforces the words of Jesus. says, God is God of the living, not of the dead. And if you're not careful, this could really mess up somebody's theology here. But Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were talking to him. You want to know what they were talking about? I did. So let's look that up. Back to Luke chapter 9. Verses 30 through 31. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory, Jesus was transfigured into the, with the glory of God. And Elijah and Moses appeared with, in glory. We're speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus was talking with Moses and Elijah about what he was going to do in Jerusalem. The plan of salvation was being discussed. Apparently Moses and Elijah understood that Jesus was going to have to suffer. He was going to have to be tried, found guilty, even though he was innocent, beaten, crucified, buried and then raised again. So you're saying, well, yeah, but somehow they've seen the other side, so they knew. We still haven't seen that part. But they knew. They were talking. And it's interesting that that conversation was recorded, at least the topic or the subject of their conversation was recorded. We don't know any of the details. That if one of the disciples had to have heard that for that story to have been repeated, to get recorded, because as we know, Luke investigated. He found witnesses to everything he wrote about. Why that didn't why the disciples still didn't get it? Why didn't they get what Jesus had to do? I mean, after all, there was Moses and Elijah. Now what I want to know is how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Were they wearing name tags? Because remember, they didn't have photo IDs back then. There was no photo ID in the I'm sure there was no photo ID in the Pentateuch and the Torah and and and, and, and all that to you know here is, this is Moses, so if you happen to see this guy, you, you know who you're talking to. But they knew. And it's really not important, it's just something I point out. How did they know? But apparently the Holy Spirit told them. Perhaps Jesus told them. But they were talking. And why is Moses, and the appearance of Moses and Elijah so significant? Moses is considered by the Jewish people to be the top prophet. He was the giver of the law. And Elijah was second. Elijah was, did so many works. He called down fire from heaven. And it consumed 
the sacrifice. Elijah slayed all those priests of Baal. The giver of the law and the prophets. The who the Israelites would have considered the most authoritative people that they could have gone to. How often when we're reading, say Romans or something, man, I really wish I could go back and ask Paul what he meant by this. I'm sure that at times some of the Israelites probably said, man, I wish I could ask Moses or Elijah what was going on here. Because they were there. They, had the, they wrote it down. They lived the stories. They had the authority to know what it was supposed to mean. Why do I make such a big deal out of it? Because of verse 7. We're coming up to verse 7. Now what would you do if you had been falling asleep and had and woken up? And, and Luke 9 verse 32 says that Jesus had to wake them up. And shortly after that, that's when they saw all these things take place. Woken up out of a sleep, and all of a sudden you see this, and I don't know what to do. What do you want to do? I, did, did, I missed the instructions. And so Peter, God bless Peter. you got to love Peter because he didn't let tradition and, 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 and um, convention stand in his way. Peter was a man of action. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. I'm, she's, she's probably going, I know, that's why I brought you here. I know it's going to be good for you to be here. That's why I brought you here in the first place. I wanted to show you this. I'm hoping it helps you understand what's, what, what, what my mission here. And, and, and Peter says, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter didn't know what to do. I got to do something. Oh, I mean, I got, there's Jesus, there's Moses, and Elijah. I got to do something. So, so let's build these booths. And perhaps some have suggested that Peter, hey, we got him here, let's, let's keep him here for a while. And then God shows up. It's not that God wasn't there, but God makes his presence known. The cloud forms, and it overshadows them. We've all been out on a sunny day, and the wind is probably maybe blowing pretty good, and the clouds are moving, and, and all of a sudden you're, you're doing something, and all of a sudden the <clears throat> cloud comes across and blocks the sun, and you're in, it, you're in its shadow, and you're in its shade, and you can feel it get colder. I mean, it might be 85, 90 degrees, but you can still feel it get a little cooler. <coughs> it's like you can feel the presence of the cloud. Or perhaps you've been up on a mountain and been hiking or whatever it was and all of a sudden the clouds blow in and you can just feel that presence. God shows up. <coughs> Excuse me. And he says this. This is my beloved son. He identifies Jesus is my beloved son. Now listen to him. And the next thing you know, Moses and Elijah were no longer around. What did God mean? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. He's saying, Jesus is my authority. He has the authority. You listen to what he says. Don't worry so much about what Moses wrote, what Elijah did. You listen to what Jesus, my son, said. <coughs> he is the authority. And if you remember early on in Jesus' 
ministry, when he was teaching, what, how did they marvel? They marveled at him because he taught as one having authority. He knew what he was talking about. He didn't have to guess. When he said this is a proper interpretation, that was it. There was no black, or there was no gray. This was it. God saying, listen to him. He's my son. He knows what I want done. He knows what I said. That is the implication. We listen to Jesus. And we know that the disciples saw this because we have it recorded and, and if you go back into Second Peter, Peter even, he doesn't bring this up this episode up specifically, but he talks about his time with Jesus. First Peter one verses sixteen through seventeen. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And I have to think with what he, how, what he says and how he says it. It's at that time on the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter is remembering and recalling. He was a witness to this. That he received the glory and the power from God the Father. What was God not so subtly telling them? Listen to my son. Jesus up to this time has been trying to tell them what Messiah was supposed to do, what the Son of Man was supposed to do, what his ministry was, and they were rejecting that. They didn't want to hear it. They were like the little child going, la, 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 I don't want to hear you. After God speaks, Moses and Elijah are gone. Why? Not because what they wrote down, what they said or what they did was irrelevant, but because they were no longer the supreme authority for God's message. Jesus Christ is now the supreme authority for God's message. Now it's interesting... As we move on into verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, now all this happens and it's like, wow. They're coming down the mountain. And he gave them orders to relate, not to relate to anyone what had happened until they, the Son of Man rose from the dead. Now you would think after seeing all this and hearing what Jesus had told them up to this point, they would have understood who the Son of Man was. And what he was supposed to do. They had an idea that Jesus was the Son of Man, but they were still confused. And it shows in verse 10, they seized upon the, that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. Is Jesus being literal? Is he going to actually die and rise from the dead? Or is this some sort of figure of speech? Some sort of metaphor or allegory? And they're trying to figure out what that meant. And they still don't know or, and are unsure. And they asked him saying, and, and this is one of those, they asked this question to kind of, in a way they're challenging the notion of who Jesus is by asking this question. And two, they're kind of changing the topic. But they're, what they're really doing is they're challenging their understanding of what Jesus has been telling them. And they asked him, saying, why is it that the scribes say, now remember, God just told them to listen 
to his son Jesus who he said this is my son listen to him and now they're bringing up the scribes not Jesus say that Elijah must come first well Jesus if you're the son of man where's Elijah he hasn't come are you really the son of man that is the underlying question that they're getting at. Why, does Elijah, why is it that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answers and he says, Elijah does come first. He says, does come first and restores all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man? So you, you understand, you know what Elijah is supposed to do, but what do you understand? What do you know about the Son of Man? What's he supposed to do? What's written about him? He's trying to jog their memory. What's written of the Son of Man? That he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt. Jesus is trying to remind him about the other prophecies about the Son of Man. Not just the one where we have the conquering hero come. The conquering king and establishing his new kingdom. And he's saying the Son of Man is going to get treated with contempt because that's what Scripture says. He says, But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. That had to be kind of a, okay, wait a minute. Confusing to the disciples. Yet they still had the wrong focus. Now, Jesus, back in Matthew, if we go back to Matthew 11, verses 7 through 14, Jesus says this, And this is, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. It says, As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Quoting from Malachi 3. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet... The one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Jesus, just as God in the cloud says that this is my son, Jesus, before that took place, says that John the Baptist is the Elijah that is prophesied. John the Baptist didn't even know this. So you go to John chapter 1. Verses starting at verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, excuse me, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but con confessed, I am not the Christ. 
They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. And they answered him and said, Who are you that we may give answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but one among you but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day Jesus, they saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who is higher who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I thought John was six months older than Jesus. How can this be? Anyway, moving on, John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the whole, in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist did not reconcile, did not reconcile, excuse me, recognize himself, I'll get it right, as being the Elijah foretold in Malachi. Yet he was. He prepared the way. He pointed out who Jesus was. He declared he was the Son of God. Now we know from Matthew that when that the disciples understood that Jesus, and it's uh, Matthew seventeen thirteen, that. Jesus, or that the disciples understood that Jesus was talking about um, Elijah, as, or excuse me, as John the Baptist, as being the Elijah that came before him, says so. They still didn't get who Jesus was. Not at that time. And I want to take you back to the, 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 the healing of the blind man that took two healings. Two touches, because that's important. I think it's representative of the fact that they recognized Jesus as the Messiah. They had the wrong vision. They didn't see clearly yet the correct vision. They saw, they had this fuzzy image of Messiah. And it was going to take another touch of Jesus' hand upon them before they clearly understood. And we find that in Acts, that that takes place. When the Holy Spirit comes and descends on them like tongues of fire, they finally get it. Their eyes are opened. And today, I think there are times in our lives when we have to look and recognize that we don't fully understand who Jesus is and we just have to cry out, Lord, I don't understand. I need another touch. I see this, but it's still fuzzy. I need you to bring it into focus for me. But the point is, we need to listen to Jesus. He is the authority. You want to get into the presence of a holy God you want to have your life transfigured, shall we say, transformed from normal to holy. We need to f listen to Jesus when He says, come with me and pray. Come with me. Search the Scriptures. Let me speak 
into your life. Not every Bible has it, but mine, you know, has the letters in red, and those are to be the, as we know them as the words in Jesus. When we're reading Scripture, when we're reading the Gospels, we need to let those letters in red speak to us. We need to listen to them and obey them. They still didn't get it yet, and they won't get it for a while. And that's okay. It's okay if we don't get it. If we don't get why we're going through what we're going through. If we don't get it. We still need to listen to and obey Jesus Christ. That is the important part. That is the command of God. I'll read you verse 7 again. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. <coughs> God is not asking. Would you listen to him? He's not suggesting. You really need to listen to him. He's commanding. Listen to him. There would be those who would say, well, if you listen to Jesus, good things are going to happen. And good things will happen. But bad things are going to happen too. But Jesus is still there. Listen to him. We need to listen to him today. If you'll bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, I thank you for Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to listen to him daily moment by moment as, as, as you commanded, Heavenly Father. You commanded us to listen to Him. You identified Him as your Son. The one who represented you here on earth as the ultimate representative, as the ultimate authority here on earth of your will and you commanded the disciples and you command us today to listen to him Lord I pray that you would give us ears to hear Lord give us hearts that are filled with compassion and mercy and love for those around us Give us hearts that are drawn to you. Lord, so that as we go and spend time in your word and spend time with you in prayer, that our lives will be transfigured to such a degree that the world will stand up and take notice. And they will notice that what happened in us could not happen by any other means. Jesus' clothes was transformed so white, Scripture says, that no, no person on earth could have made him that white. Lord, transform our lives such that people know that nobody, nothing on earth could have done that. That the only way it was done, the only way that we were changed is by the power of your Spirit moving in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would cause our lights to shine. Lord, help us to be obedient, to come to you to spend time with you in your presence. Lord, it's it's awe-inspiring. Isaiah didn't know what to do. He knew he was doomed because he was in the presence of a holy God. Moses was changed because he was in the presence of a holy God. Lord, I pray that our lives will be changed because we've been in the presence of a holy God.
I thank you. Jesus, I thank you for coming, for giving yourself for us, for dying, for taking upon yourself the weight of the world's sin so that we could have forgiveness, could experience God's mercy and grace and live with you forever and eternity. I thank you, and I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.